G'day guys, and today I want to make a video on dispute resolution, something to help you manage those often untenable quagmires and pitfalls of resolutions between two people with opposing ideas or opposing perception of an event or something of this nature. Specifically, this is going to be a method that is peaceful and non-confrontational, because as I've said many times before, there's only two ways to resolve a dispute, with words or with violence. And obviously we want to try and reduce the chaos of the world um, that is created through violence and that sort of thing as much as we possibly can. It would not do bear, uh, not bear well for society if we all ran around just punching each other and trial by combat every time we had some sort of minor dispute. Additionally, I also want to try and learn from my own experience. Uh, recently I've gone through several disputes with uh, friends and things of that nature and looking back, it, it was not pleasant and I'm thinking to myself how can I have made this more efficient, uh, more pleasant for everyone involved. And of course the best way to learn is to teach others, so here we are. Also I can provide value to the world at large with important information, which is always a great thing. Uh, an important disclaimer though, I am in no way, shape or form any kind of psychoanalyst, any kind of psychotherapist, I don't have any formal training, I'm just a guy with a microphone. These are just ideas that I found really cool, that have appealed to me, and I want to share them with everyone so that we can all learn a little something today. So let's get straight on into it. So a couple things that I see in a dispute and things that I've sort of learnt as I've been going through my own life is that there's a couple of obstacles to work around in a dispute. So if we want to resolve a dispute, it is essential that we listen rather than just wait your turn to speak, because otherwise you can't be really uh, be said to be having a conversation. So for example, if you're just sitting there and all you're thinking is, wow, I just can't wait to deliver some you know, massive verbal uppercut to, say, uh, to this person when they stop talking, well, you're not having a conversation, you're just throwing verbal uppercuts at one another. Not very productive at all, not very respectful at all, both to yourself and uh, other people because you know, you're obviously considering yourself to be some sort of arrogant figure that you know, doesn't need any advice from this other person and of course you're not even listening to them, which is uh, self-evidently disrespectful. You must also be clear on the definitions and or emphases placed on certain words and phrases. Otherwise, you may as well be speaking two different languages due to the breadth of nuance and perception of the human experience. A few months ago, I had a very lengthy debate with someone on the manner of safety and responsibility and that sort of thing. And the reason why this debate went so long is because this person considered safety be, to be some sort of objective metric rather than sort of relative term. Um, I hate to break it to you guys, but safety is a relative term. You're never ever completely objectively safe. You're always in some level of danger at all times. You know, uh, if you're in some sort of war zone, you can be said to be in a very high degree of danger. But even if you hide yourself away at some corner of the earth, you travel all the way to Antarctica, well, you're still in some kind of danger. You know, you build yourself an igloo to protect yourself in the cold. Well, there may be some cancer might get you or someone might be really determined to come kill you and that sort of thing. So you're never really objectively safe. It's a relative term. And if me and this person had agreed upon what safe meant, we could have resolved this uh, dispute in our perceptions much more quickly. But as, as it was, we were getting so hung up because we weren't speaking the same language. So that's two key things that I've identified just as an individual. Of course, being no psychoanalyst, no expert, there may be others that I'm not even considering. And of course, you should leave those down below in the comment section if you are aware of something I'm not. Now, the structure of dispute resolution that I'm going to propose today is a good idea is something called reflective listening. Now reflective listening is really cool because the structure of reflective listening allows you to partake or work around these obstacles I've just said as part of the back and forth of the dialect. Now to sort of explain what I mean by this I'm going to read a quote from Carl Rogers, one of the 20th century's great psychotherapists. He was a great, um, he placed great emphasis on empathy um, he was a psychotherapist, obviously, he, so he's talking about a, a patient-client, um, oh, sorry, a, a therapist and client relationship, but I think it bears, um, it bears great relevance to interpersonal disputes, not necessarily between uh, two experts. So what he says is, if finding yourself in a dispute, you should institute this rule. The rule is as follows. Each person may only speak up for himself after he has first restated the ideas and feelings of the previous speaker accurately and to that speaker's satisfaction. So straight away we can get an idea of how this can help us overcome these two obstacles that I've talked about before. Because if you have to um, re restate the 
the ideas and feelings of um, the person you're speaking to, well, obviously you have to listen because it's going to be very obvious if you didn't because you'll go, ah, uh, yeah, you said uh, something about how you felt sad or something. So it'd be very, very obvious that you're not listening if you're not able to sort of speak back what the person is saying. Additionally, once you have formulated some sort of uh, restating of their ideas and you speak it back to them, if you don't place, uh, the, the way you explain it will highlight uh, your opinions or your definitions or your perceptions of certain words or events and the emphases that you place on them. And people can obviously correct you. So you may say, oh, you were feeling you know, pretty sad about the fact that uh, your boyfriend dumped you at the party and the person can correct you say, no, I wasn't feeling sad. I was feeling devastated. I don't think you've quite grasped the emphases I was placing on that certain situation. So straight away, just there, we've seen the ways that these method of communication can help us overcome these two obstacles. But something else is to think about is how this method of communication, this reflective listening, can also help us be empathetic towards the other person. Because if you have to take on their perception of reality, both past, present or future, depending on what you're discussing, and we have to take this on and we have to attempt to formulate it in essentially their own words, because it has to be something that they're happy to accept, well then this obviously very demonstrably and objectively and by definition, whatever you want to say, helps us be empathetic because, you know, we're trying to essentially see the world as they saw it or see it or will see it, depending on, again, the time frame. And we have to use words that they'd be happy by, uh, happy to accept. And this means that we have to be sympathetic to their perspective and, it, and in at least that little moment, take on their perspective in order to use words that they'd be happy to accept. So obviously for Carl Rogers, who was very big on empathy, this, um, method of communication was very useful for him and his uh, various theses. And I think it's also going to be useful for us as individuals in a more interpersonal sense because it forces both parties to listen, to consider, to think, to structure a response rather than just wait for their turn to speak. Alright, so what I'm going to throw up on screen now is a model for reflective listening. Uh, developed by Dalma Fisher, uh, who is an associate professor at Boston College. I won't read the whole thing out because that'll essentially double the length of the video and you're perfectly capable of reading yourselves. I would encourage everyone to either screenshot this or look it up yourself and write it down. Just do something to help you remember this so that you can recall it when you find yourself in a dispute because it's obviously no use if you can't recall it. And if you're like me with a very shitty memory, well, you're going to need as much help as you can get. I think there's a lot of cool points here, uh, things that I want to try apply in my own personal life so that when I come to a dispute, you know, I don't view that as some terrible, horrible event, some tortuous thing that I'm just going to have to sit through and endure, uh, suffer through, chew through the glass and that sort of thing. It can be something that can actually be productive and maybe even pleasant because obviously if you present yourself a very respective and empathetic demeanor, well, that's a lot more pleasant than you know, slinging around words and being hurtful and that sort of thing. And obviously, we want to try and be pleasant when we're resolving disputes. We don't want to inflame the situation. And I think this um, is an appropriate way to go about it. So I wish you all the best luck in resolving disputes within your own life, peacefully and non-confrontationally. If you have anything to add to the conversation, if there's a perspective or model that you've seen that you've found really, really cool, please don't hesitate to stick it down in the comment section below. This is all a space where you can learn and attempt to uh, bring a little more civility and pleasantness to our dispute resolution. Thanks all for sticking around and have a good one.